Hi again. Welcome back to another week of Universal Algebra and Lattice Theory. This week we will actually be covering much more lattice theory than we have previously, and so let's get to it. As always, I have to take a second to drag my tools over here, make sure I have the right pen color, and we're in business. So, as I said, we'll be discussing lattice theory much more this week. And so today is all about posets and lattices. So first, I'm going to give some uh, motivation and some history behind the study of posets and lattices uh, and universal algebra in general. Then I'm going to define and discuss posets and then lattices. And after we have the basic definitions, we'll talk about the relationship between isotone maps and homomorphisms of lattices, isotone maps and continuous maps on corresponding topological spaces, uh, the lattice of open sets in the topological space, and lattices as they appear in probability theory. So let's get to it. All right. Well, remember that we had a definition of a lattice already, which didn't require this auxiliary concept of a poset in order to define. So we had said that a lattice is an algebra with two basic operations, which we call meet and join usually, if it's just some generic lattice. And uh, with these two basic operations, L meet and L join are both semi lattices, which remember means that they are commutative idempotent semi groups or commutative idempotent associative magmas, if you want to think of it that way. And also, we need these identities, which are called the absorption laws, which relate uh, meet and join together. So we had this definition of a lattice, which is purely algebraic, already. So lattices are actually going to serve as interesting examples of algebras, which don't look much like groups or rings. Uh, there are some cases where there is some sort of translation or overlap, but generally speaking, uh, lattices behave quite differently from groups and rings. At the same time, understanding lattices will help us with the theory of general algebras. So they both serve as an example for us, but also actually as an abstract tool. Uh, this is kind of similar to uh, the role that groups play, uh, where in algebra they are an example of algebras, but they also uh, naturally arise in a more abstract way as the automorphism groups of algebras. So uh, they sort of play both, both the role of an abstract tool and a specific example. Okay, so we'll see on another day how to make collections of congruences, subuniverses, and varieties into lattices. Lattice theory also has deep ties to many other areas of math, as I already sort of mentioned before, uh, including combinatorics, topology, and probability. And we'll so talk about some of those connections at least a little bit today. Now for the, the history portion of uh, today's episode. So back in the 19th century, George Boole introduced what are now called Boolean algebras, which are special cases of lattices. And he studied those quite a bit in connection with logic. So by 1898, Alfred North Whitehead first used the expression universal algebra in the sense in which it is used today. Uh, in his book, A Treatise on Universal Algebra, which included both groups and Boolean algebras, among many other things. But uh, he wanted to have a term that uh, sort of emphasized that he was discussing many different types of algebraic systems. And at the time, um, these things weren't generally considered as all being instances of the same sort of thing. And so in order to uh, not stretch the word algebra too much, I suppose he uh, used the term universal algebra to mean that he was talking about things like groups and also things like Boolean algebras, which are examples of what we now call lattices. So around the same time, Richard Dedekind 
as we previously remarked in an earlier lecture, worked with lattices of subgroups around the year 1900. So lattice theory only really became established as a mathematical discipline in its own right during the 1930s and 40s. Um, so even though there were these beginnings in the 1800s and early 1900s, it wasn't really until the 30s or 40s that lattice theory became its own mathematical discipline. Garrett Burkhoff published on the structure of abstract algebras in 1935, and this paper established universal algebra as a branch of mathematics. I'll link a copy of this paper in the description. Uh, however, I don't think I'm going to put it on the associated list of recommended reading just because it is often uh, significantly more challenging to read the original version of an idea than to read the very clean, modern way that it has uh, been presented by subsequent authors. So if you'd like to, though, you can go and actually read the original presentation of this from 1935. All right, so uh, Burkhoff used lattice theoretic ideas in this paper. And in 1940, he published an entire book on lattice theory. And so you can see right from the beginning that there was a very close connection between uh, universal algebra and lattice theory. Oystein Orr referred to lattices as structures and led a short-lived program during the 1930s where lattices were hailed as the single unifying concept for all of mathematics. And so uh, we can't really get too much into the details of this, but basically um, just like how we have a definition of algebra in universal algebra, which is a concrete mathematical definition that generalizes groups and rings and modules and lattices and other examples of algebraic structures that we've seen. Um, we, you know, we actually give a concrete definition that can generalize all of those things. This is different from what happens when you first start learning abstract algebra, usually, where you're told the definitions of these things separately and they're referred to as algebraic structures but an algebraic structure, an algebra, is never actually defined in general as, an as a mathematical object in its own right. So um, one might wonder if there is a more general definition than our definition of algebra, which can capture things like topological spaces or other sorts of uh, more <laughs> complicated structures that one encounters in uh, mathematics. There have been a few different attempts uh, to do this over the course of, uh, mostly over the course of the 20th century. Um, and uh, Ors was probably um, one of the first really serious ones. And he, it was very successful initially, but it, it died out pretty quickly. Um, so his idea, as we'll see uh, going forward, was that if there are these natural ways of associating to every mathematical object, whatever that means exactly, uh, a lattice in our language or a structure in his language, then we should just study that lattice and that will tell us everything that we need to know. Uh, and so we'll see um, today and going forward many ways that we can associate a lattice or what or would have called a structure to any sort of mathematical thing that we're interested in looking at. Uh, and, and that idea is very useful in many different areas. However, um, we'll see examples later on where the, a particular lattice that you would like to associate to uh, something like a group, for example, can't necessarily tell you all the information you'd like to know about the group. And so uh, it turns out that there are some shortcomings in this approach that make it, um, while it is very useful, um, it is not really uh, capable of encompassing all of mathematics in the way that Orr wanted it to. Um, and so I'll give some more concrete examples of that, uh, of that shortcoming later on in the semester. Um, okay, so, uh, but lattice theory did become established as a discipline, um, even though uh, Orr's structures did not completely take over the world. Um, and so during this period, when um, Orr was running this program of uh, 
lattices as structures, the single unifying thing for all of math. Uh, Saunders McLean was studying algebra at Yale, I believe, under your under Orr's advisement. Uh, McLean went on to become one of the founders of category theory, which, while not explicitly um, picking up where Orr's program of structures uh, left off, uh, category theory does have a similar role today as being sort of an uber unifying uh, theory of mathematical objects. <laughs> um, and category theory will also perhaps not capable of very easily or explicitly expressing every single thing you would like to in mathematics is certainly much more successful in this regard. And so category theory remains in this role where lattice theory sat only briefly. <laughs> All right, so that's enough abstract, very abstract history. Um, now let's get back to posets, which were the first types of objects that we actually needed to consider today. So although we defined lattices as algebras previously, it turns out that orderings on sets are going to be very relevant here. We say that a binary relation theta on a set A is anti-symmetric when for all x, y, and A, we have the x theta y and y theta x implies that x is equal to y, that they're actually the same element of A. A partial ordering on a set P is then a binary relation on P, which is reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. We usually denote a partial order by the symbol uh, less than or equal to, but this doesn't have to mean less than or equal to in any conventional sense with which we're familiar, as long as that relation satisfies reflexivity, transitivity, and anti-symmetry, then we sometimes will use this less than or equal symbol to denote that binary relation. Uh, we refer to a set P equipped with a partial order on P as a poset. So for example, the set of natural numbers under the usual uh, ordering, where one is less than or equal to two, and two is less than or equal to three, and so forth, uh, this is a poset. And so that's an example of a poset. It happens to be uh, infinite and perhaps a, a bit more special than a typical poset, but there's an example. Oop, skipping right ahead here, okay. So in order to depict a poset, we may use a Hasse diagram, which is a graph whose vertices correspond to the elements of the poset and whose edges indicate the ordering. And now, how do the edges indicate the ordering? I will explain that by way of an example. So let's consider the poset on the, on the set of elements A, B, C, D, E, and F with A strictly less than D, strictly less than E, B strictly less than D, strictly less than F, and C strictly less than D. Now, what do I mean by strictly less than when I've been talking about less than or equal to as a partial ordering? What I mean is that, for example, A is less than or equal to D, and A is not equal to D. So that's what I mean by A is strictly less than D when I'm just talking about the partial order less than or equal to. And so that's also pretty standard. And so when we draw the Hasse diagram of this poset, we draw A down here, represented by this dot, and then D up here with a line going between them. The line going between them means that they're comparable. So either A is, A is less than or equal to D or D is less than or equal to A. And the fact that D is higher up on the page or above A, even though it's not straight above A, means that D is greater than or equal to A. And since they're represented by different dots, they're not equal. So D is strictly greater than A. Similarly, E is strictly greater than D since E is above D and there's a line connecting them. Now, we don't draw a line connecting A and E, even though A must be strictly less than E by, our, uh, by the transitivity of our relation, but we don't draw this line here because we already know A is less than D from this diagram, and D is less than E. And so we can infer by looking at the diagram that if we go up and go up again, that A is less than E. 
And so it would make it messy and not be as helpful to draw all of the lines in. Um, so we don't put a line between A and E. Now, similarly, B is less than D is less than F. So we have B below D here and D below F. And finally, C is below D. And as a consequence of that, we also know that, for example, C is below E and C is below F. So that's how to uh, draw or read a Hasse diagram. And uh, so if you have two vertices which are not joined by an edge, it's possible that either you have a situation like this where A is actually below E, but we don't draw that edge because we can already go up from A to D and then D to E. Or sometimes what happens is you have a situation where uh, we have two vertices like E and F, where E is not greater than F and F is not greater than E and they're different elements. We say that they're incomparable. And so these two guys, uh, down here, I'll go over here. So these two guys are incomparable to each other because neither one is greater than or equal to the other one. And so these also don't get an edge, but for a different reason. Okay, so that's how to read a Hasse diagram. Now, given a post set, say on the set of vertices P with a binary relation or partial ordering, actually, uh, sigma, we define the dual of P to be the post set with the same vertices whose partial order is sigma smile or the converse of sigma. And remember that this is the set of all uh, BA so that AB is in sigma. Or in other words, we're just going to flip all of the ordered pairs in sigma. And if sigma was a partial order before, it'll still be a partial order if we switch the order of all of those ordered pairs. Okay, so the Hasse diagram of, um, okay, so we write P, um, P partial or P uh, with this curly D here to indicate the dual of the post at P. And notice that uh, P dual is, um, has a Hasse diagram, which is just the Hasse diagram for P upside down. And you can check through this example if you'd like and compare it to the previous one uh, to see that it actually does make sense that if you swap all of the ordered pairs and make B less than or equal to A when A was less than or equal to B before, that will just flip the Hasse diagram upside down. So what we had before was this, and what we have after is this. Note that the labels actually change too. So A was down here in the original Hasse diagram, and then it is up here in the new Hasse diagram for P dual. Okay. So now we're ready to talk about lattices in a slightly different way than we have already. If we have a post set P, we are going to write A less than less than X uh, in order to denote the statement for all little x and x, we have that A is less than or equal to x. So A less than less than big X means that A is less than or equal to all of the things in the set X. So in the case that A, uh, we have this A less than less than X, we say that A is a lower bound for X. And so we can read this as saying A is a lower bound for X, which sounds a little nicer. So we say that a lower bound A of X is the greatest lower bound, or infimum, or infimum, depending on your inclinations, of X, when for all little p uh, elements of our post set, we have that if little p is a lower bound for X, then little p is less than or equal to A. And so it makes sense to say that A is the greatest lower bound if in fact any other lower bound would have to lie below A. And so we can picture this in the following way. So if we have that this is our post set P and we have uh, some, some uh, subset X here. So we might have lots of different lower bounds for X that are things that lie below X, but sometimes there will be one single thing 
um, like A here, which is the greatest lower bound in the sense that if we were to draw this Hasse diagram, everybody that was below X was actually below A, and then A is below all the stuff in X. So that's what it means to be the greatest lower bound or infimum of a set X in a poset B. We can also define upper bound and least upper bound or supremum or supremum or whatever. <laughs> um, similarly, by just flipping all of the uh, all of the orderings in the previous definition. Oh, and by the way, uh, the real numbers under their usual ordering can be seen as a poset and the definition of greatest lower bound and least upper bound here actually generalizes that for the real numbers. And so if you've seen uh, these concepts in analysis, this is actually a more general version of the same idea. Now we can define, po or now we can define lattices again. So a lattice is a post set in which every pair of elements has a supremum and an infimum. Of course, we already have a definition of a lattice as an algebra, which is that it has two binary operations, meet and join, which give us two semi-lattices related by these absorption laws. So, of course, it only makes sense <laughs> to have these two different definitions of a lattice if they're somehow equivalent. So if we have a lattice as a poset, we can define an algebra. So P meet join, where the meet of X and Y is the infimum of, of the set XY, and the join of X and Y is the supremum of XY. So this algebra is always a lattice viewed as an algebra. Uh, there's also an inverse mapping that takes any lattice as an algebra to a lattice defined as a poset. So if I have a lattice algebra, I can define a partial ordering by saying that x is less than or equal to y whenever x is equal to x meet y. So the corresponding poset that I get is always a lattice viewed as a poset. But now these two mappings are actually inverses of each other. Uh, don't worry, there's some set theoretic thing about uh, if you were to try to write this down as a function, it would be a pretty big function because it can take any lattice or any, um, any lattice as a post set or any lattice as an algebra as an argument, even though um, there are a very large amount of those. But don't worry about those set theoretic things. They won't bother us. Uh, these two mappings are inverse mappings of each other. And so there is this uh, bijective correspondence between lattices as posets and lattices as algebras. And so we actually will often translate back and forth between these two ways of viewing a lattice without explicitly saying that we're switching our uh, mode in which we're thinking about the lattice. And it will be very helpful to be able to swap between these two ways of thinking about lattices very readily. So now let's consider those functions which respect poset orderings. These are going to uh, be somewhat similar to homomorphisms of lattices as, as algebras. They naturally have homomorphisms, uh, as all algebras do. And uh, we'll see what the relationship is between these isotone maps, as they're called, and the usual homomorphisms of lattices as algebras. So if we have post sets P and Q, where P's partial ordering is denoted by less than or equal to superscript P, and Q's partial ordering is denoted by less than or equal to superscript Q, we're going to say that a function F taking P to Q is isotone when given any X and Y and P, we have that X less than or equal to P, or X less than or equal to Y in P, implies that f of x is less than or equal to f of y in q. So uh, we want to have this pictorially. Say here is the Hasse diagram for p, and we have x, and we have y here. And I can draw a straight line. Okay. So we have x and y, and 
maybe there's a bunch of other stuff in this Hasse diagram, but I'm just going to draw a circle and say in there, that's the Hasse diagram for P. Well, F is isotone when if I apply F and I go over to Q here, I'm going to have the F of X is actually below F of Y in Q. So if that happens for any X and Y that I choose, then we say that F is isotone. And so you can visually think of it as preserving this ordering in this Hasse diagram. If Y is above X before, it must be taken over to something above um, F of Y must end up being something over F of X. Now, explicitly in the Hasse diagram, it may not be that there is a line between these two guys because, for example, maybe there's something here above F of X and then something, uh, and then F of Y is above that. But this picture I just drew should give you this uh, sort of intuitive idea that this is um, that this is the situation that we're expecting. Okay. So we write f from bold p to bold q in order to indicate that f, the function mapping p to q, is an isotone map from bold p to bold q. And of course, whether f is an isotone map depends on the posets p and q that we're considering. If we had different orderings on, on these sets of uh, vertices, even if there are different poset orderings or partial orderings, then uh, we may no longer have that this particular f is an isotone map. And so this is exactly the situation for homomorphisms as well, where a function is only a homomorphism with respect to the structure of the algebras, um, say A and B, that that homomorphism is mapping one to the other. Okay, so when P and Q are lattices, and F from P to Q is actually a homomorphism of algebras or a homomorphism of lattices, according to the definition we've given previously, we have the F as an isotone map. And so that's, uh, that's relatively straightforward to see because if I, uh, okay, so if I have that X is less than or equal to Y in P as a poset, then what that means is that if I want to talk about this as a lattice theoretic thing, this means that if I take x, um, if I take x meet y in in the, the lattice p, then that's actually just equal to x. And so now if I apply this homomorphism f taking p to q as lattices as algebras, <laughs> then I end up getting I end up getting that f of x meet in Q, because this is a homomorphism, I can say that this implies that f of x meet in Q, f of y, is equal to f of x. But then that's what it means in order for f of x to be less than or equal to f of y in Q as a poset. So it's pretty straightforward to verify that any homomorphism of lattices as algebras will give us an isotone map between the corresponding posets. However, and this is where we have to be careful about translating between lattices as algebras and lattices as posets, not all isotone maps between lattices are homomorphisms of the corresponding algebraic structures. So all homomorphisms of the corresponding algebras give us isotone maps of the posets, but not all isotone maps of the posets give us homomorphisms of the corresponding algebras. This picture is the standard example that shows how this can happen or not happen. So this F depicted here takes uh, this poset, which we can think of as our poset P here to this poset or lattice Q. So both P and Q are, are, are lattices as posets or as, as algebras. And this function F is going to map zero to F of zero here. It's gonna map A to F of A here, B to F of B, and one to F of one here. Now this thing is another element of 
this post at Q, which I did not name, it's just some other element. And so this function f is an isotone map between the corresponding post sets because a is above zero, and here f of a is above f of zero, b is above zero, f of b is above f of zero, one is above a, and f of one is above f of a because f of one is above this unnamed thing, which is above f of a, and also one is above b, and we do have the f of one is above f of b because f of one is above this unnamed thing, which is itself above f of b. And so this function f that's depicted graphically here is an isotone map of posets, and both of these posets happen to be lattices. However, this is not a homomorphism of lattices. And so in order to see this, let's now name this unnamed, previously unnamed thing, and let's say this is x here. This, this vertex here is x. Well, if I compute, uh, if I compute f of a join b, where I'm taking the join in p, this is going to be f of 1. However, if I compute f of a join in q, f of b, I'm going to get, well, the join of f of a and f of b, the least upper bound of these two elements, or in other words, the smallest thing that's above both of them, is x. So this is x because if I have any upper bound for both for this set, f of a and f of b, then, uh, then x is less than or equal to that upper bound because the only upper bounds are x and f of one, and x is less than or equal to x, and x is less than or equal to f of one. However, these two guys are not equal to each other, and so, we can't have a homomorphism because if f was a homomorphism of lattices, then we would have to have that f of a join b in p is f of a join f of b in q. Since it's not, this isotone map of lattices as posets fails to become a homomorphism of lattices as algebras. And so if you need to remember <laughs> which way it goes, are all homomorphisms isotone or are all isotone maps homomorphisms? remember this picture, and this picture is the standard example that shows that not all isotone maps are homomorphisms. Okay. Now, we do have uh, a result here that does relate um, isotone maps to homomorphisms um, in a stronger way than what we had before. So if we do have a bijective isotone map F taking a post at P to a post at Q, then if F inverse, the inverse function, which exists because we're assuming that F is bijective, if that inverse function is also isotone, then F is a lattice isomorphism. So in general, an isotone map does not give you a homomorphism of lattices, but if you have a bijective isotone map with an isotone inverse, then you actually have a lattice isomorphism. So we can't totally salvage the situation, and this is a little kink in the correspondence between lattices as posets and lattices as algebras, but, uh, well, but we do have this in the case of isomorphism. So let's actually go through this argument in a little more detail. Well, we, uh, since we already know that f is bijective, we just need to show that f is a homomorphism because an isomorphism is a bijective homomorphism by definition. So we need to show that if we take any a and b in our post at p, that f of a meet b in p is f of a meet f of b in q. Well, just for shorthand, let's say that c is defined to be the meet of a and b in p. So we know that c is a lower bound for the for the uh, set a, b in the post set p, because it's actually defined to be the greatest lower bound. That's what the meet is. And so by isotonicity, 
we have that f of c is a lower bound for the set f of a and f of b. And that's because having this condition means that c is less than or equal to a and c is less than or equal to b. And so by the fact that f is an isotone map, we assume f is an isotone map, we have that f of c is a lower bound for the set f of a and f of b. So it remains to show that f of c is the greatest among these lower bounds. We knew that c was the greatest lower bound for the set a, b, but we just know that f of c is a lower bound for the set f of a, f of b. So let's take some other lower bound for this set, f of a, f of b, let's call it x. And we're now going to actually use the f inverse is isotone, which we haven't mentioned yet, and we certainly probably need to use somewhere. So uh, we see that if we apply f inverse, since it's isotone, the preimage of x under f is a lower bound in p for the set ab. And this is because we have that in q, we have that x is less than or equal to f of a. And so isotonicity says that f inverse of x is less than or equal to f inverse of f of a. But because f inverse is the inverse function of f, this is just a. And similarly for b. So the preimage of x is a lower bound in the post set p for the set a, b. But that means that the preimage of x is, a is less than or equal, oh, okay, this doesn't need to be, this doesn't need to be this, that's a typo, less than or equal to c in p because c is the greatest lower bound of a and b. So any other lower bound, like the preimage of x under f, is less than or equal to c. But then if I apply f again, I see that f of f inverse of x must be less than or equal to, in q, f of c, because uh, f is isotone, but then f of f inverse of x is just x. So I have, oh, and here's the same typo again. I was just really excited about that lower bound notation when I wrote this. Um, so uh, x is less than or equal to f of c in, in the post at q by isotonicity of f now. Okay, but what does that mean? I took some lower bound of the set f of a, f of b, and I showed that that lower bound had to be less than or equal to f of c. But since f of c is a lower bound for this set, f of c, by definition, <laughs> must be the greatest. I mean, okay, now we can use the definition to see that if it's the, if it's the lower, a lower, <laughs> it's, if f of c is a lower bound and any other lower bound, such as f, or such as x, yeah, <laughs> is less than or equal to f of c, then uh, that means that f of c must be the greatest lower bound of the set f of a, f of b. But that's precisely what it means for, for um, okay, so if f of c is the greatest lower bound of f of a and f of b, that means that f of c is equal to f of a, meet in Q F of B. But that F of C is, well, C is A meet B in P. So this F of C is actually the left-hand side of this equation. And that's what we were trying to show. So we actually have shown that if we take uh, the image of A meet B in P under F, then we actually do get F of A meet F of B in Q. And so we can do an exactly identical argument for join to show that uh, F also respects joins. Um, we just have to change all of the greatest lower bounds into least upper bounds and uh, swap the ordering everywhere else, but it's exactly the same argument. We actually say it's the dual, uh, just like we had the dual pose set before. Uh, there's a dual argument for uh, join that works exactly like the argument for meet. Okay, so, well, in general, isotone maps don't have to be homomorphisms. If we do have a bijective isotone map with an isotone inverse, 
then we know we have a lattice isomorphism as algebras or as cosets, if you'd like. Now let's look at some connections between uh, posets and their isotone maps and other uh, sorts of mathematical mappings now that we've discussed homomorphisms. So we can associate to any poset a topology in the following way. If we have a poset, we say that D, some subset of the points in our poset, is a downset of P when given any X in D and uh, any Y in P, we have that Y less than or equal to X means that Y is actually in D. So we think of D as a lower set like this. So if this is our set of points P with this ordering less than or equal to, then a set D like this is a down set when if I take any X in D and any Y in my post set, which could be in, in D, although that's kind of the boring case, but otherwise I take any Y in my post set, say up here, then, um, well, okay, if, if Y was less than or equal to X, it would have to be in D. So basically anything that is above all the things in D is not, is not in there. Well, either way you can think about that. So D looks like a bunch of stuff down near the, near the bottom. If you're below something in D, you yourself are in D. Okay. So I guess what we can't have happen is this situation. We can't have, uh, we can't have a set, we can't have a down set that looks like this where there's some Y in here, some X in here and Y is below X, but Y is not in D. That's not allowed to happen. And so that's why that's why down sets have to look like this. They have to sit at the bottom, at the bottom of the, the post set. Okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to use down p this notation to denote the collection of all down sets of a post set p. So we actually have that down p is a topology on p. I won't prove this, but you can verify it for yourself that actually if you take this as your collection of open sets, um, that you, you, will act, you will get a topology on the set of vertices P, or the set of elements P. Moreover, a function F taking P to Q is an isotone map from the post set P to the post set Q if and only if it is a continuous map from P with this down set topology to Q with this downset topology coming from the poset Q. So actually, in this sense, isotone maps are precisely <laughs> continuous maps between the corresponding topological spaces. And in particular, this means that each homomorphism of lattices, since remember homomorphisms of lattices are isotone maps of the corresponding posets, each homomorphism of lattices is actually a continuous map between the corresponding topological spaces. And so although uh, it looked like maybe we had something algebraic, this definition of a lattice is an algebra, or maybe it had a more theoretic, maybe it had a more order theoretic formulation as a poset, it turns out that actually, if we're only concerned with homomorphisms as algebras, um, those, those, uh, those turn out to give us um, continuous maps between topological spaces. So uh, these things, although initially they might seem like quite different things, they're all actually very closely related to each other. Uh, so we've just seen how to make spaces from posets, including lattices as a special case, but we can also produce lattices from topological spaces. So this new mapping is going in the other direction, <laughs> although it's not, um, it's not really an inverse to the, the previous one. It's just a, a different uh, sort of thing that we can do. So there are many ties between these areas of math. Uh, so if we have a topological space T with some set of points, uh, just plain T and a collection of open sets tau, then if we actually take the set tau as our set of elements or our universe of our algebra, 
where this was our open sets before, then if we take our universe to be our, our collection of open sets and me um, and join to be intersection and union of sets, then this algebra is actually a lattice. And so um, that's just because by definition in a topological space, arbitrary unions of open sets are open. So in particular, the union of two open sets is open. And since I'm allowed finite intersections of open sets, and th those will still be open, then um, certainly the intersection of two open sets is still open. And so this uh, collection tau will be closed under um, intersection and union, and these do obey the necessary properties in order to have a lattice as an algebra. So this is one of the observations that leads to the study of what is called locale theory, or more humorously, to pointless topology. So uh, you might say, well, if I can create such a, a lattice um, as an algebra or as a post set from a topological space in this way, then um, since everything about the topology basically has to do with what are the properties of its open sets, when are they disjoint, how can I find things um, that separate them, and so forth, it's uh, it's reasonable to think that you might be able to recover a lot of results in topology without referencing the actual points themselves, since pretty much what you're concerned with are the open sets. And so uh, locale theory is a realization of that effort that has gone a long, a long way. Oh, and of course, people call it pointless topology, not because it's a pointless endeavor, but because uh, the idea is that you don't have to actually work with the specific points themselves. Just the open sets are enough, but the open sets give us this lattice. Okay, so lattices also appear in measure theoretic probability theory. And uh, this thing uh, I'm going to end on is something that, um, well, strictly speaking, does, doesn't have to be introduced when one is learning about uh, measure theory or probability. I think that it's it's nice for those of us who are aware of such things um, to at least have it pointed out that uh, the objects of study here are actually precisely things that we're already familiar with, uh, such as lattices. So recall that a sigma algebra, not to be confused with our definition of an algebra in universal algebra, a sigma algebra on a set X is a collection of um, collection of subsets of X, big sigma, which contains uh, the entire set X and is closed under complementation, as well as taking countable unions of members of X, or members of sigma, excuse me. So it follows from De Morgan's laws that for, uh, for sets, that is, that any sigma algebra is also closed under taking countable intersections. So if we have a sigma algebra, big sigma, we can actually form a lattice whose uh, elements are those sets in uh, the sigma algebra, big sigma, uh, and our meet and join operations are again intersection and union. So although I just said a minute ago, a sigma algebra isn't by definition an algebra in our sense, each sigma algebra has a very natural algebra in our sense to which uh, we can associate it, namely this lattice, sigma intersection union. Uh, moreover, this, uh, this lattice, this lattice structure on sigma is actually a special kind of lattice. We say that it's bounded, complemented, and countably complete. And we'll discuss some of these properties of lattices on subsequent days, uh, because we are now getting into the part of the semester where I'm going to talk a whole bunch about lattices. <laughs> Well, thank you again for sticking with me, and I will be back soon to tell you about the modular and distributive laws.